Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome again to the virtual open iftar 2021. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Adnan and I'll be hosting um, for the first half of the session. We'll then be joined by Farah uh, in the second half. So today uh, we have an event around the mosque designs in Britain and we're joined by Shahid. Um, I'll have a bit more of an introduction to him a little bit later on before explaining a bit more about the agenda um, and, and the program of activities today. So first and foremost, um, I want to be able to thank our media partners for this year. We have the Islam Channel, so a special welcome to all the guests joining us from the Islam Channel's Facebook and YouTube. It's a pleasure to have you here um, joining us today. I um, also want to give a shout out to Arts Council UK, who without their help, we wouldn't be doing what we are right now. So um, all this support is definitely helping us to be able to put this program together uh, and offer the, the interactions that we do. That being said, RTP can, uh, is, is definitely, uh, we value everyone's inputs um, and you can check out some of, more of our work online as well. Um, and we really want to be able to encourage everyone to get involved with the Ramadan Open, Open Iftar packs that we have online. Um, a lot of this, a lot of the work behind that helps to be able to not only feed people around the world um, in terms of charity, but also there's lots of cool different, different um, gift bags inside it as well you can find. So our work this Ramadan is supported by Islamic Relief um, and they are charity partners and you can check out their incredible work online at Islamic Relief as well at iruk.co slash rtp. Right okay so um, since we're on Zoom this is recorded today um, uh, however we do encourage everyone to put the cameras on. We like to make this interactive we want to be able to see who's around, um, where you're joining from, how your star is going and I think we're what, nearly 19 days in now so um, it's more of an interaction but um, some more of the rules around Zoom really is um, if you're on the, the desktop version you can see at the bottom there's an option that says reactions. The reactions button is really cool to be able to interact with not only us but also the speaker, um, be able to ask questions by raising your hand um, and then we can come on to you straight away or you can also just have any of the other emojis on there as well so I think you've got a clap, a thumbs up, um, you're feeling really there's a joy button there as well. Cool. So I think on the mobile phone, if you're joining us from mobile phone, I think there is a more section. Um, and from the more section, you can then use the reaction button in the same fashion as well. Um, so that should be available. Right. So that's all the house rules. Right. The plan and agenda for today, let's run through that quickly. So we started a couple of minutes late, but never mind because we have a lot of a lot of time ahead. Um, and, and we do apologize for the rate line runnings as well. However, we're going to have an introduction to the speaker around about half past half past seven. Um, and it will be about 20 minutes long presentation, I believe, um, followed by a question and answer section at 7.50. The question and answer section will run for about 25 minutes or so for the Azan at 8.25 today. So we'll look to conclude at 8.25, uh, maybe a few minutes just before that as well for a reflection, reflection period. Um, and then normally after the exam, we'll come back and do the final round off as well. Okay, but before we do that, obviously we like to see who's around and, and, and what's happening. Um, not seeing too many people on Zoom today as well. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's Juma and everyone's, you know, got their own plans today, but um, definitely going to try and grab Khutum here as well. If I can unmute you and have a little, have a little chat. Asalaamu Alaikum Khutum, how you doing? I'm good. Hi, Sam. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How, where, where, where are you joining us, joining us from today? From London. From London, okay. North, yeah. south, west, east. Which east. The, east. East. East London. So I'm actually looking to move to East London very soon. So I've, I've got a few viewings um, near Stratford area. Um, yeah. All right. Fingers crossed I can find, find the right place. Um, and how, how's your fast and, and how's January Ramadan been so far? Um... It's been good. I've had, I guess the beginning's always hard. Um, but other than that, like over the last few days, it's been, it's been pretty good, alhamdulillah, yeah. Good, 
good, good. I actually find that um, after the after the first week, for sure, it's, it definitely gets it becomes the same thing, right? I, I don't mm. think I even eat anything in the morning now. It's all for I think it's all just a bit of water is enough to go, and you got the whole day ahead. So you're you're saying no to this? I can't. I can't. I can't. I have to at least eat, even if it's just a fruit. I can't just go without eating. Um, oh, really? what, what do you go for? Um, either I usually make like smoothies for like the whole family. Um, you make jalebis, did you say? Smoothies. Oh, smoothies. Smoothies <laughs> oh, in the morning. Which, what, what kind of smoothies are we talking about? Um, dates, because we have a lot of dates. So, so dates with like either like berries or bananas as well. Good shout. Yeah. Good shout. Okay. Uh, I need to. Uh, maybe get into it one day I was trying to um, explain to my my workplace so I, I tried tried making um, you know the my mind's 10 period I just sort of like book it off to say no meetings and that just because I want to mm. get an extra hour of, of sleep if I can yeah. but I was trying to explain to them there's so many benefits of fasting it's not just about not being able to eat and um, you know the first question is always like you must be hungry you must be you know really like cranky um, all that it's just like no actually we're it's, it's actually very nice um yeah. and I read I read a lot about uh how the body actually goes into this state of re, uh not only detox but rejuvenation um yeah. and it starts to sort of heal itself so um I'm gonna have a little chat with the workplace and sort of explain the benefits um are you are you working at the moment or are you studying what's your I'm working at the moment yeah what do you what do you do so I'm an assistant producer uh like a creative charity organization oh nice yeah in london as well i suppose yeah 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 it sounds like you're enjoying it you've got a big smile on your face when you're talking about work yeah yeah i'm enjoying it partly because i've i've started recently so i guess i'm still like on a bit of like i guess excited about it a little bit i don't know how i'll be in like a few months yeah yeah maybe but for now i'm enjoying that yeah yeah, I think it gets better normally. My experiences were um, I, once you get more experience, when you know what, what's going on with the uh, with the workplace as well, like, sort of sort of got better. And then it comes to the but mm. that, that's what that's what mine is anyway. But no, it's, that sounds really good. Um, I'm actually I'm actually gonna bring in Shahid as well because it'd be quite good to see, just to hear your perspective and, and how it's going as well. So I'm from Shahid. How you doing? Hi oh, Sam. Yeah, good. Thanks. All good. Yeah, good, good. Are you also joining from London? Yeah, I'm in East London, actually, so I don't know where you're thinking of moving to, but maybe nearby. Um, since, I mean, your background is architecture as well, I suppose, so maybe maybe you can give where, me some recommendations. Yeah, where, where, are you, where are you moving from? So I'm based west in Reading, um, and I was in south for a little bit, but more towards Epsom area, which doesn't, I don't know if it counts as London, but yeah. I don't want to be in the south, um, and I don't want to be in the north. There's not enough happening in that area. So I'm thinking either west or east, and at the moment, east is probably the most affordable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, places like around Stratford and uh, you know those kind of areas are pretty good. You know, Olympic Park is there, and it's quite easy to get into town and things like that, and it's a bit cheaper. I'm in, I'm near Victoria Park, so a bit closer in. Um, yep. So yeah, I mean, you know, but as you can go from here, you can just go outwards, and then it. It's still pretty good all the way out, really. That's exactly. So you hit the nail on the head. East Village is exactly where I'm looking. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have the park next to you. Everything is convenient. Yeah. Um, and you can go you can go outside further, but you can also get inside as well, um, which is exceptional. And before we get to the topic um, of, of mosque designs, um, talk to me a bit about some designs of buildings in London as well. And more specifically, though, the one in Stratford, the Arcelo Mittal, I think it is, the controversially, the, the, ugly, the ugly slide. As yeah. they call it. Yeah. What's your opinions on that one? Um, yeah, it's not it's not particularly attractive, and there's a lot of steel, isn't it? When you look at it, there's a huge amount of uh, kind of stuff there. It seems like there's a lot more material than you need to build a tower that size. Um, but it's kind of it's quite interesting, I think, to look at. You know, it's quite a sort of um, unusual structure, and it's quite. I've never been up it actually, and there was that time where there was the. I don't know whether it's still there. There was a slide that you go up to the top and come down on the slide. Oh. Yeah, I think it might still be there. I'm not sure if COVID restrictions have, have stopped it, um, yeah. but that's exactly what it is, isn't it? It's unusual, which is what makes it so, I guess, appealing or attractive yeah. or, or curious. Um, yeah. And maybe that's what, what gets the attention because I think Arcelor Mittal are, 
probably a construction company or of that sort. Yeah, so. and I think they're steel, uh, steel, steel, steel fabricated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so steel provides. So I think a big, big steel uh, uh, company. So I guess that's why there's so much steel in it. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, we got some contacts. Um, and and generally as well, how's has your fast been, and how have you experienced this month? Um, and yeah, it's, it's it's okay. I mean, yeah, there's that. Um, sort of time in the middle of the day where you sort of feel it a bit more, and then I don't know. By iftar, it doesn't seem to matter after that. <laughs> so yeah, I'll feel it thing. earlier, and then after that is yeah. <laughs> and and do you also have um, anything at Seri? Maybe a smoothie? Maybe maybe nothing? Just water, like me. At iftar, you mean? Uh, at Seri, at Seri. Oh, oh usually kind morning. of cereal or something like that. Yeah, yeah nothing uh, too. Just, cereal yeah. yeah okay okay so i'm not the only one doesn't yeah. eat nothing a little bit of, yeah. little bit of food is all right but okay good good so it is half seven as promised um and uh and so we will get into the speaker and shahid salim is a practicing architect um and a design studio leader at the university of westminster um he's also a senior research fellow at the bartlett school of architecture um and i believe ucl work and ucl working on a survey of london's project on the urban history of whitechapel I'm yeah. going to leave it there. I'm going to give you a full full chance to give a full introduction to yourself as well. So um, on to you, Shahid. Yeah, no, that, um, I, that White Chapel project is actually more or less finished now. So I've pretty much finished the role at, at UCL uh, on that particular project. So that's being written up and it's going to be published probably soon. Um, so I'm teaching at the University of Westminster and mm -hmm. uh, I teach architecture. I teach at this undergrad design studio and I teach um, history and theory there. And I have an architectural practice as well, and I do sort of small, smallish projects. Um, and I'm working at the moment with some of my former students, which is very nice, and a couple of them are here. So I'm hoping that they okay. might be able to um, contribute a little bit because we have worked on some mosque projects together uh, as well. That's, that's good to hear. If you do see the names, uh, either just ping me a message and I'll, and I'll uh, yeah, put them yeah. up. I think some of them. These two is Hannah and Nabiha, so that you can see them in the. Uh, in the thing, <laughs> so. uh, Hannah and Navia, if you if you want to come on the the video, you know, more than welcome to as well, mm -hmm. um, or even interact, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to see, um, yeah, yeah, and hear their perspective as well. Yeah, the, we can get them. They'll they'll, they'll interact uh, uh, once I've you know uh, as we have our conversation because um because the because what I want to talk about is the kind of predicament or the kind of his story of mosque architecture in Britain and you know in Europe and in the West. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think they might have some interesting ideas because they've been thinking about that as well quite a lot, and actively designing as well. So it'll be it'll be that a nice good. chance to have a conversation about it as well. Excellent. Well, I believe you've got a presentation for us, um, mm -hmm. and and the topic is mosque designs in Britain. So I, I'll pass it on to you for this for the presentation. I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah. Okay. Let's see where was my right. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'll try and keep it pretty short. Uh, there you are. Yeah, I want to just talk about a very quick overview, not so much on the history of the mosque in Britain, because that would that's a sort of slightly separate topic. But I'm just going to kind of go through uh, the story of the mosque in Britain, looking at a few examples. Uh, and I'm going to look at these examples and talk about them in relation to uh, how the how the approach to the mosque has changed through the 20th century, really, uh, and what each one, you know, what each design uh, suggests, and and you know what its character is, and then it, and then I want to sort of end up with a series of questions, really. So what I'm looking, what I'm hoping to do is have like a quite nice conversation and questions for the um, participants who are here, um, and the questions are around, you know, what's the direction that mosque architecture should take or, or where should a mosque architecture in Britain go from here so let's um work towards that so the first built mosque in Britain was in 1889 and it was built in Woking uh, and this is an image of it and you probably have seen it. it's quite famous now uh, and it was built by a Hungarian Jewish uh, linguist actually it was commissioned by a Hungarian Jewish linguist who was settling in London after having spent his life working in India and uh, he was very interested in the the languages of uh, India. He was he was he wanted to set up an establishment to teach the languages. And in the grounds of that organisation, he wanted to build a number of pavilions. Uh, and the mosque was one of the buildings that he wanted to build. And it was 
it was designed, it was intended as a kind of representation of the Muslim world as he'd experienced it. So this, this mosque very much falls within that period of uh, Victorian Orientalism um, and kind of the fascination with the East and the fascination with these uh, uh, exotic cultures, if you like. So it's a kind of exoticization of the Muslim world uh, and of the vision of the Muslim and you know the Indian world and the subcontinent and so on. So it's very much a kind of quite a flamboyant and quite expressive uh, building built by Europeans, largely I suppose for a kind of European audience. And that was the end of the end of the nineteenth century. Um, it then I'm going to I'm going to kind of jump a little bit. So I'm going to to nineteen uh, forties uh, to Cardiff in South Wales, and Cardiff was quite a key location for Muslim settlement in Britain because it was a port town uh, and the ports were the places where Muslims first came to and settled in terms of form, form settled communities because it was largely uh, the, the early settlers were um, formed by uh, um, communities from the sailors so there were sailors working on ships and the sailors were from uh, Yemen and Somalia and Bangladesh but particularly in Cardiff it was Somali and Yemeni sailors who would be working on the ships that were going between you know britain and empire as it were uh, and they would then uh sort of you know get off the ship settle in cardiff get married start a family so on and so on so you started to get these settled communities around the docks uh, and you started to get the earliest mosques in these areas um <clears throat> earliest mosques mean pre pre world war ii and there weren't many between Woking and, and Cardiff, there weren't really many, if any, uh, sort of established mosques at that time. Um, so Peel Street was one of the streets in the docks area of Cardiff, and it was one of the earliest mosques that was built there or established there. And what you can see from this slide is that you've got this terrace of uh, workers housing, so terrace, you know, two, st two story housing, pretty straightforward streets of uh, Victorian housing. And the community had bought three of the houses in the middle of the street and they had knocked the houses down but left the front facade. Uh, and in that front facade, they placed these, these lattice windows, these kind of mushrobia type windows. And then behind that, they were, and as you can see in the plan, the, the aim was that behind that they would build the mosque building. Um, and I found this really interesting because uh, this is where you start to see this fusion of the existing architecture uh, the existing kind of local architecture of, of the city, in this case Cardiff, and the introduction of an Islamic, uh, you know, new idioms of Islamic architecture. And you get that, you start to get that combination of architectural and styles and therefore of cultural um, histories coming together in this, in the, these buildings. So this, this building in Peel Street is in a way that one of the first places where you start to see that combination happening. Uh, and I find it really quite an evocative, uh, uh, interesting relationship. Um, by the time, oops, Daisy, uh, let me try and move to the next slide. Um, eventually, the mosque looked like this. You can see it's a very, uh, you know, distinct uh, element sitting within this very standardized uh, Victorian urban landscape. Um, so you get this introduction of this completely new language, which again is a really compelling image. And it's one of the earliest images that I found, and certainly the earliest mosque that I found, which is a completely new architectural language placed within the existing uh, urban landscape. And that mosque uh, is, it existed till 1988. Um, and this is a photograph of it in 1988, just before it was actually demolished. So you can see What's happened is all the area around has been knocked down by now uh, and just the mosque remained and then the, mo the mosque was not there. So it's all sort of re, uh, uh, redeveloped and so on. But really quite an interesting distinct vocabulary and architecture. There's another mosque in South in Cardiff as well. There's, it was the South Wales Islamic Centre, which you see here. Um, this is a reconstruction of it because it was around the corner from Peel Street and it was um, it was it was built between 1969 and 1979. So it was uh, it existed between 69 and 79 uh, and then it was demolished. So we did a reconstruction of it from drawings that we found uh, in the archives. Uh, and it, again, it was very interesting because what you start to see in this building is the fusion of a post-war modernist architecture with an Islamic. So this circular prayer hall with this concrete shell roof 
uh, was very characteristic of post-war modernism uh, at the time. Uh, so you know, English post-war modernism, and it's being it's being utilised for a completely new type of cultural practice. So what you start to see in this building is the combination of architectural styles. So it's not like Peel Street; you had the house and then the mosque, and the two things gradually kind of merged. But here you start to get a new language emerging from the combination of different cultural you know, traditions, different architectural traditions. So again, it's the sort of attempt to create an architectural language uh, which is distinctly, uh, if you like. Uh, British, I think. And this is uh, uh, sort of moving, this is again just seven, seven or eight years after the South Wales Islamic Centre is the Regent's Park Mosque. It was built in 1977. Um, it's one that you probably know, it's obviously quite a famous landmark building. It was designed by a very eminent uh, English architect called Frederick Gibbard, uh, who was quite a renowned modernist architect uh, of the 20th century. And uh, he won the competition for the mosque in 1969. And what he did is uh, he combined again, similarly to South Wales, he combined a series of architectural languages, quite a distinctly modernist language. So modernism would mean, for example, uh, using the use of concrete, which was a very uh, a particular material uh, in, that, in, in the modernist aesthetic uh, and having open walls. So you can see with this building, the walls are not load bearing, but they're curtain walls, so they're fully glazed. And that, again, was a characteristic of modernist architecture. Um, so it's a very kind of modernist building in its in its in its uh, construction methodology and its materiality. But he combined it with quite traditional Islamic elements like the dome and the minaret. Uh, and he was quite consciously doing this because he wanted to have a, a, a mosque. This was this was being designed as the main mosque for um, Muslims. Uh, in Britain, it was kind of the national mosque. And he did it quite consciously because he knew that he wanted to have a building that Muslims could relate to and understand. So he quite consciously uh, utilized uh, 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 recognizable Islamic symbols as such as the dome and mirror, but he tried to do it, he tried to sort of render them in this uh, modernist language. So again, like with South Wales, you start, it's this kind of fusion of architectural languages and an attempt to create an architecture which is particular to uh, the place that it's in, like this place that it's in, in terms of the European or the UK context. So just to think a little bit about a kind of social history, um, there was, uh, uh, you know, 1947, the partition of India uh, and the gradual and the start of the period of decolonization. Uh, so Britain retreating from its kind of imperial uh, role um, and and colonies, uh, former colonies becoming independent. Um, and then various kind of acts, I and mean, this kind of just lists a series of kind of immigration acts uh, through, through the decades after the partition of India, which were being formulated in response to migration into Britain from the former colonies, so from the West Indies, from South Asia, uh, later on from you know, East Africa and so on. Um, so, you know, large scale migration coming into this country uh, Muslim migration uh, and the kind of new multicultural society uh, emerging. Um, so that was a kind of climate post-war that you started to get a more multicultural um, character uh, to the nation. And the other thing that I'm interested in is, is oh, I think quite a lot about is the process of um, colonization and then the moment, if you like, of, of decolonization and what happens uh, to histories, uh, to culture, to traditions through that process of, of colonization. And uh, it's often called the, what, the, you know, a rupture, a kind of colonial rupture. Uh, and this quote from a um, historian uh, is quite interesting. So he, he says that colonialism breaks things, it shatters an imagined wholeness, the colonizer explodes, native and cultural solidarity producing the spiritual confusion psychic wounding and economic exploitation of a new and dominated other colonial rupture is the social psychological cultural and economic equivalent of a paradigm shift words and relations on either side of the co colonial rupture are incommensurate so he's he's saying that um there's this quite massive you know uh, uh, um break that colonization forces on people um, and on the two sides of that rupture, there's two, you end up with two quite distinct. The way I understand it is you'd end up with these two quite distinct and different 
uh, trajectories. So in a way, for example, there's a certain continuity, let's say, in Muslim history uh, and in Muslim you know, thinking and culture and philosophy and so on, that you could argue stretches from the time of the Prophet up till the period of colonization. Um, which would be, let's say, uh, you know, 18th century onward, 18th century through to the early or mid 20th century. Um, and that period of colonization breaks that tradition. And it's not, I'm not saying that there was a tradition which was, um, you know, uh, uh, one tradition. There were many traditions, uh, many Islamic traditions. Uh, there was, of course, conflict within those uh, different, you know, dynasties and peoples and nations and so on. I'm sure, sure all of that happened, but nevertheless, I think there was still a certain type of continuity, certainly in terms of artistic and uh, cultural uh, production. So our, our, our architecture, culture, uh, traveled across and circulated through the Muslim world uh, from that time of the Prophet through to the point of colonialized, colonization. And then there was this break. Uh, and then on the other side of the break uh, is this period post post uh, uh, independence and, it, and it's the other side of the break that I'm interested in which is that kind of diaspora uh, because I think that's what we're in now and what we where we are and what we represent is the other side of that that process of colonization it's it's the kind of remaking now the reconstitution uh, of these cultural uh, trajectories so I I I feel really that what the, the, the kind of what diasporas are involved in is a process of reconstruction uh, of cultural, uh, historic, uh, religious uh, and architectural and artistic reconstruction. And there are attempts to re reconnect with that with that tradition that has been uh, uh, kind of broken or ruptured, if you like. So it's interesting to think about the mosque in Britain or in the diaspora as one part of that process. Uh, of attempts to reconstruct. And I think the question then comes up is to what, in what way does that reconstruction happen? Is it an attempt to simply replicate uh, history or is there an attempt to, um, to uh, uh, sort of create a new language uh, which is part historical and part based on the contemporary? Uh, and I think that's where the kind of idea of the, that, 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 I think that's the kind of dialogue that the mosque is involved in at the moment. So in the early period, of um, post-war migration. So from the sort of 1960s, 1990s, if you like, the mosques that were, built, were being built by first generation migrants, um, they were often built in this uh, quite an ad hoc style where uh, different uh, architectural languages were brought together. So lots of kind of Islamic references and they were combined with the local architecture of a particular place. Uh, so in these examples, for, you know, you see local brickwork is used as pitched roofs, um, there's windows that you might find on on, on houses. Um, so there's kind of there's a combination of the local vernacular architecture of the particular place that they're in, uh, being combined with a replicated Islamic elements through that period, and so you end up with this kind of amalgamated or ad hoc uh, architecture. It's less deliberate than Regent's Park Mosque or South Wales Islamic Centre, which were kind of designed as it were. This is more it kind of happens as people design it themselves in very, in very many cases. Um, what happened after that was, so, so this is uh, just talking about, uh, again, kind of social history from 1989 onwards, uh, or from 1979, 1989 onwards, a kind of global uh, emergence of the idea of the kind of, of a, of a kind of Muslim category. Uh, and that happened in this country, I think really from 1989 onwards, where the um, Rushdie protest was seen as the first uh, point at which a distinctly Muslim political and cultural identity emerged in Britain. Before that, uh, migrants from South Asia and so on were, were considered more racially than they were religiously, so they were Asian or, or, or black and so on. Um, but it's really from 89 onwards that the category of Muslim uh, emerged as the primary identifier. Uh, and it was uh, the 20, I think it was the 2001 census, uh, which was the first one to include religion as a category. So you see this kind of process of the construction of the category of Muslim as a, as a primary identifier happening over a period of time. Um, so before that, there was no religious identification on the census, for example. Um, so uh, I think along with that, uh, I think what I've observed is the re-emergence of a particular kind of historicism uh, in the architecture of the mosque. 
So this is a, I mean, I, in my research, I sort of like pinpoint that down to this particular building in Leeds, which was in 1996 designed by an Iraqi born architect, uh, engineer uh, based in UK uh, called Atba al Samurai. He's a very prolific mosque designer. Uh, and he uh, designed this mosque in Leeds. And it was the first one really, I think, where the idea of the mosque as a as an amalgam of different styles is replaced with the idea of a mosque as a kind of fully Islamic historicist uh, uh, representation. Um, so as you can see in this drawing, and these are the photographs of it, um, compared to the previous photographs, there isn't that combination of architectural styles. There isn't the pitched roof, there isn't the kind of gables, um, there isn't any kind of referencing to the local architecture. It's a distinctly um, sort of, you know, uh, historicist, you know, other objects. It's talking about being from a being of a different uh, cultural trajectory, um, and I sort of wonder whether the, this went along with uh, the reemergence of the kind of cate category of Muslim as a distinct social and political category, uh, which was, you know, UK based, but also a, a global trend, I think, as well. And um, <clears throat> another other example, so you know, that the, the the Leeds Mosque was the first one, I think. But you know there were other examples that followed. So this one in Leicester, which is a, is a kind of a replica of a Fatimid Egyptian mosque, although the community was a, a, a Indian Gujarati community. This one in Bradford, um, which again was designed by Al Samurai, which is um, you know really kind of like a celebratory Islamic building. The, the, the sandstone here was from Agra. Uh, lots of minarets, lots of domes, and this is a, a very distinct uh, you know building in the landscape. Uh, in Bradford, and a number of mosques in this in this vein, early twentieth century, so two, the two thousands, two thousand tens, this kind of period. So alongside this, uh, there's also the idea of the kind of modern mosque, if you like, the kind of avant-garde uh, modernist design. And these are a couple of examples by Mangere Vaz architects. Uh, and here you can see that the visual language and the aesthetics uh, are very different now. They're very much uh, in a kind of more and more sort of architecturally, um, no, I suppose avant-garde, you know, modernist contemporary um, language. Uh, so their references are very different. The reference, the root sources that they're, they're they're looking at for their language, for their architectural language, is really very different from uh, these buildings that are looking to Islamic history. Uh, and they these buildings might combine. Uh, sort of Islamic references in different ways. Uh, this is a proposal for a mosque in Copenhagen, um, which again, uh, similarly, uh, is quite a modern, uh, you know, contemporary uh, uh, version or interpretation. Um, and this, the architect saying here that it's Nordic interpretation of Islamic architecture and brings the meeting of Nordic and Islamic building traditions to Denmark for the first time. So the idea of the mosque, you know, the architecture being this kind of cultural meeting point uh, and cultural fusion uh, is another line. And I'll just show a few examples of buildings in that vein. This was a proposal for a, a mosque in Copenhagen. And this was by uh, quite a very prominent architects called BIG. Um, so these are, I suppose, you know, you could say sort of Western architects, like non-Muslim architects designing mosques and they're looking at them as a way of them combi combining different uh, languages. But again, they're not necessarily going to, to they're not necessarily drawing um, uh, deliberately from traditional sources, but it's a very much a reinterpretation uh, of traditional sources in certain ways. I mean, abstraction, reinterpretation to various degrees. Um, and then this one is one built in uh, Sydney, which is a very interesting one, because again, it's a very distinctly contemporary language uh, with certain inflections of uh, Islamic architecture, reinterpretations of traditional uh, Islamic motifs. Um, and this one in Turkey uh, um, uh, by uh, M Emre Aralat Architects, which is built partly into the landscape, again, quite abstracted, uh, quite modernist, um, in its materials and also in its in its treatment, uh, the kind of spaces that it's creating, the concrete you know the, con the concrete um, materiality of it as well, um, and the light that sort of comes down. So it's it's, it's a very sort of a, a distinctly and not a traditionally Islamic space. 
Um, and then also, so alongside those examples where the buildings are quite uh, uh, modern, uh, contemporary, uh, also contemporary examples of the mosque, which is, which is again, reflecting or referencing traditional typologies, but, but interpreting them in a different uh, innovative way, if you like. So this one is in Cologne. Um, and you can see it's, and it's a Turkish community and it's commissioned by the Turkish government, actually, in fact, and, uh, or the kind of religious authority of the Turkish government. And uh, you can see that it's kind of based on the idiom of a Ottoman mosque, uh, but it's treating that whole language in quite a distinct and different way. Uh, and then just to look at a couple of my own uh, proposals, just to give an idea of my, where, where I've tried to uh, uh, sort of negotiate this, this uh, architecture as well. This is uh, tiles that I was looking at in there in the V&A Museum. And um, uh, I was looking at this kind of tile pattern, which is quite a common pattern across kind of Central Asia around the sort of 13th century. And uh, I was using that as the basis to create this facade for the mosque that I designed in just on Hackney Road. Uh, and I was interested in using that tile pattern, but abstracting it. So it's kind of a direct reference to a point of Islamic history, uh, but it's also quite an abstracted um, way of treating it. And I wanted to sort of try and create, and what I tried to do is create that balance between something which is in a way uh, quite rooted in sort of traditional sources, which are quite literal and quite readable um, but 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 sort of combines it with other approaches, other kind of architectural approaches and materials and designs and so on. This one is in Aberdeen, uh, which I designed a couple of years ago, or it was built a couple of years ago. Uh, and this one is in Perth in Scotland, which is just getting planning permission at the moment. So uh, the idea is that they would be buildings which kind of fit in their landscape, but they're also slightly out, slightly sit slightly differently to their landscape as well. So they are representing quite a different culture uh, and a new way of uh, doing things, if you like, but they are also connected. And that's the kind of way that I try to approach these buildings. Um, and just to look at, just to look at, just last example is Cambridge Mosque, which is an interesting one, again, because it sits, uh, uh, you know, the ambition of the Cambridge mosque was that it should be an English mosque. So that when they, when the client set out to design it, he, that he said, and the architect said, this should be a building which is particularly, you know, rooted in its place, uh, but connected to um, Islamic history. And the idea was that um, it was based on the garden, the kind of idea of the Islamic garden, which you can see in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, and the plan is based on that. It's quite a traditional uh, movement that you have through the plan from the garden at the front to the um, portico to the kind of foyer and then into the prayer hall, which is tilted towards Mecca. Um, but it's that procession is quite a traditional procession through uh, Islamic architecture uh, in many, many examples. So there's a very sort of traditional um, route to the building, I think, a kind of basis to it. Um, sorry, and this is the front uh, elevation of it. So as you kind of walk in through the garden into the main uh, portico here, uh, and the kind of distinct feature of it is these other geometric columns that you get. They become these kind of timber trees, uh, and they're all based on quite distinct this, uh, Islamic pattern work. It's called the Breath of the Compassionate. It's quite a, a sort of established uh, Islamic geometry, and that geometry kind of runs through the building in different places. It's in the sort of door designs and so on, but it's it sort of characterizes the um, creates the vaults of the uh, of the mosque building itself. Um, so again, it's very much attempting to be a reinterpretation uh, or a new treatment of quite traditional uh, and historic Islamic uh, lineage. So again, it's that idea of trying to, I think, you know, trying to connect with uh, an Islamic history. So the idea of the diaspora trying to reconnect or reconstruct a particular type of trajectory, a particular connection with Islamic history, culture, arts, and so on, uh, through this, through the buildings that they build uh, here. And that just takes me to the last slide, where it's a kind of summary of the things that we've looked at, or suggesting a summary, which is, you know, are, and this is really a question, which is, are we looking at uh, these uh, typologies, if you like? So there's kind of the, you know, the Victorian exoticism. Um, there's the fusion of styles re as represented by Regent's Park. 
um, the historicism of, of you know, the, the Bradford mask and other sort of ones, which are these kind of very much uh, replicas of uh, Islamic buildings. And I think attempting, I think what they're saying is that this is what a correct or authentic Islamic building should be. Uh, and then there's these, um, you know, much more avant-garde approach where the language, the architectural language is drawing from a whole series of other references, a whole series of, in a way, you could argue a kind of European trajectory of architecture. Uh, and that forms the basis for the for the mosque, uh, but it becomes, you know, inflected with bits of Islamic tradition. Um, but the but the kind of core of it is coming from, a, uh, if you like, I suppose, a kind of European architectural tradition. Um, so for for the sake of the conversation, really, it's a, it's a question is uh, which direction, you know, wh where does the mosque sit or where do you think it should sit? in terms of the future direction that it goes in from here um, within this kind of landscape of approaches that we see uh, over the last you know, 100 years of mosque architecture in this country. Where's, where's the um, mosque to go now in terms of its architectural style? So I think that will, yeah, let's try and open that up really. I think that would be a good place to, to start. I'll stop sharing. Uh, thank you, Rahid. I think you can share some of the screens. Uh, the pictures are really good. Um, I actually quite like. So, for, I mean, first and foremost, thank you for that informative talk. Um, there's actually quite a lot in there that I have a lot of questions on. But when I, before I get into it as well, just want to say thank you. Um, sorry, welcome to Farah, who has just joined us now. Um, Hi, everyone. Welcome, Salam, Farah. Um, I do have to, uh, unfortunately, go at some point. So Farah will take over. Um, but before I go, I do want to also say as well, I believe Shahid, your, your, your students are here as well. So I encourage them to ask questions and engage as well, just for Farah's knowledge as well, that the students are here as well. Um, uh, I believe Nadia has just put the camera on now. Um, mm -hmm. So before I go though, I do want to say, and um, the designs that you had for the Hackney Road one, I believe, I'll tell you why I like that. Um, and I'll tell you why it's important to me. So I grew up in Pakistan when I was younger and I remember seeing that around, I remember seeing those specific patterns around. So for me, it's almost like a journey back to my past, but also my, also my childhood. You come to the UK and you don't necessarily find a mosque that looks like that. You just find normal, normal house, really. So when you see that, when you see, you see that in, in, in England and you, and you walk around and you, and you instantly hits you, reminds you of home. Um, that for me is why I thought, I really like that pattern. And so then the question is, loads of different questions, but you know, like people have come from all walks of life, from different areas and different places, different cultures and, and all that sort of stuff. Shouldn't they also want to see that familiarity in, in, the, new, in the new home as well? Shouldn't the new modern um, mosque look like that? Um, so I don't know if, if this is a question there, but I just wanna know more about, you know, it'd be, for me, I'd love to be able to go see that pattern and stuff, but not only for my sake, but also, you know, taking that lineage of our culture with us and understanding actually look we have come to a new place mm -hmm. i want to be able to see this going forward i want to be able to be a part of this and stuff as well i just want to get your thoughts on on that yeah i mean i'm glad that you have that response to that to the building because that's one of the things that i'm quite um quite aware of or quite conscious of is that uh you know the people who are using these buildings people are using mosques are coming many of them are migrants uh you know first generation um so they have they have uh, experiences and memories and you know thoughts about buildings that they will have experienced and used back home as it were uh and even if they're second or third generation even you know there's still the kind of visual language of somebody who's kind of second generation or third generation in this country they will have got a lot of kind of their aesthetic experience from their parents of culture and so on and so on so i think you know a lot, a lot you know most the people who are largely using mosques uh, do have this kind of alternative visual and aesthetic register uh in their minds uh, and in their experience and to me it's quite important to uh respond to that um, rather than to leave it behind completely and that's why i do try to sort of keep that connection uh in the buildings that i design but then also you know from an from the point of view of architectural kind of architectural history uh, you know and 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 the idea of modernism and modernity we have a kind of culture which is not necessarily it's not problem, problematic but the characteristic of our culture is we need to always progress uh, ideas always need to change uh, and we shouldn't be looking back to kind of revive things that have happened before we should be designing new things 
Um, and that's, that's, again, an interesting tension within architectural culture, which is, you know, you look forwards, you don't, you know, you don't, you bring things back from the past. Um, so I think, you know, as, as architects, we're caught between this, in a way, dilemma. Um, and I think it's about trying to bridge that uh, so that the work that we do is, on the one hand, uh, progressive still. Um, uh, but, so it kind of reinterprets things in new ways, but it doesn't leave it completely. It's, I feel like it's kind of a tightrope that, that we try to walk or that I'm, I'd like to try to walk, because I think it's important to retain that connection, mm. but not to simply replicate. Yeah, because... I mean, when you say a mosque to most people, they'll think of a dome. That's the first thing that comes to your mind or even the minarets that come up. And when I saw some of the other pictures, um, I can't remember which one it was, maybe it was the one in Denmark. Um, oh no, sorry, the Har Harrow, Harrow. Yeah, mm. the one in Harrow. Mm. I would have never thought that was a mosque. You know, that mm. this looks like a very modern library. That's, mm. what, that's what came to my mind. Mm. Um, so then I posed the question of, well, what is a what is a mosque at the end of the day it's just a, an area to pray but also we're sort of you know it, from our from our history books and also our knowledge and, and traditions as well traditionally there's lots of colors and domes and that sort of stuff i don't want to take up too much time um i don't have to go but i'm going to pass and we have a question from nabia as well mm -hmm. um but i'm going to pass on to, to farah to to um introduce and and lead thank mm -hmm. you Shahid, from my side anyway yeah, if i don't see you again you. but i'll definitely yeah. be in touch farah on to you I think we've lost Farah. <laughs> I think I'm staying. I'm going to unmute Nabia. Yeah, and Nabiha, remember, we can't talk about what we've just done. Yeah, yeah no, I wasn't going to. <laughs> we just done. Just, yeah. yeah, just to add on to what Adnan was saying about um, the identity of a mosque and having a dome and having certain features. I think what's really interesting from an, well, I'm not, I'm not an architect yet, but from an architect's point of view is to remember that mosques or places of prayer, especially for Muslims, don't really have to have a certain identity, it doesn't have to have a mosque, we can pray anywhere we want. And I think that's quite interesting as well, especially when you look at a place like London, where um, like the religious landscape is so broad, like you, you have mosques that are in converted grocery shops, but you also have beautiful mosques like Regent's Park mosques, which have been purpose built. And I think that's quite important to see how different communities um, ex express um, their faith spaces and how they sort of sometimes passively um, appear in terms of conversions of old buildings, even old churches. Um, I think Shah has uh, researched Brick Lane Mosque as well, which used to be a church and a synagogue, which is really important as well. I mean, sorry, really interesting. Um, so yeah, when you look at a place like London, it really can sort of exist as a, a huge, a, a quite a broad number of things. But when you sort of consider different contexts, maybe it is important to take into account the cultural and um, sort of uh, heritage sort of, um, uh, you know, connotations that a mosque might have in those specific areas. So I think that's quite an important way to think about it. Um, I think that's a good point. Um, it, it's a conversation I don't think many people have or even think about. And, and that, I think that's why it's so interesting. Um, I learned a lot just, just by looking at the journey of mosques in, in one way. Um, and what came to my mind as well, so we talked about, um, you know, immigration and, and new immigrants coming in and having to sort of have that influence. What about from the other side? What about you know the uh, the English locals? How, how what was the what was their notion? Uh, for example, in Wales, in the ports, or even in London, you know, um, seeing a new mosque come up, they've never seen it before. Mm. What does that mean for them? I mean, there's always uh, uh, throughout I mean, stuff that I've looked at, you know, historically looking at kind of mosques that are being built in the earlier periods, you know, 70s, 80s, that kind of stuff. There was always, you know, some opposition and disconcerted uh, responses and so on. And, uh, you know, responses about the kind of alien character of the buildings and things like that. But I think, you know, they're, they're again, they're, they're sort of single, you know, handful, if you like. I mean, a lot of mosques uh, generate a lot of, opposition in some locations in some places and they face quite a lot of um you know difficulty and you know, it's a long process to be able to get them built and so on um but i don't think it's you know there hasn't necessarily been a lot you would get comments about the design or about mm -hmm. it being an alien type of building and so on and so on but i think it's more you know more of the focus is on the number of people that are going to come or the nuisance that are going to cause and things like that some more kind of practical uh, uh, sort of functional things 
uh, rather than the kind of architecture of it in itself, I think. Mm, okay, Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't, I haven't myself heard of any any sort of downfalls or issues with mosques. Not necessarily. It's been more about, um, for example, in Reading, um, we, we used to basically go to this mosque that was a converted house, mm. um, and I can't tell you for how many years we basically the whole community outgrew the whole place, but still no one had enough money to be able to grow it. And it wasn't until I think new, um, I guess the younger generation when they started connecting with the mosque more, um, then they could pour money in to buy a new place. So what they did in Reading was they actually converted um, one of those, uh, it was a large office, it used to be an office before, they basically broke it down and made a bespoke mosque out of it. There isn't a, there isn't a dome or anything around it, but when you go inside, again, the architecture inside is incredible. Everything is not only modern, but it also reflects back to the, the emeralds and the, and the colors, the gold, that sort of stuff that you'd see. Um, and I think it works, it, mm. it, it, it does work. And I say it works because they, the, the, the community, the mosque, um, the, sorry, the management team, they've seen an uptick of people coming to the mosque now of all ages. Um, so I think it makes a big difference, you know, for everyone that goes past as well. And from the perspective of the locals, the issues are, are more around parking and people sort of, you know, um, abusing that that mm-hmm. power. However, I think more and more people do definitely look at it and say, actually, we want to know more about it as well, um, which is which is definitely interesting. I want to know a bit more like Hyde as well. Um, your favourite mosques, maybe in the UK or, or around as well, and why? Um, we talked about Cambridge, and I think we had uh, we had someone from Cambridge come down before and talk about Cambridge mosques specifically. But just to get a, a sort of a glimpse of what your preferences are on mosques and, and why, or what does it mean for you? Yeah, I should have thought, I should, I should have an answer to that question. <laughs> um, I suppose, yeah, check. Well, I think one of the mosques that I like in terms of the way it works as a community building is the um, Muslim Cultural Heritage Centre in Ladbroke Grove. I don't know if you know that or if, if people know that, but it's actually designed by the same architects who designed Regent's Park Mosque. Frederick Gibbard would have had passed away by then, but at his office, carried on and designed that building um and it you know it's a very uh uh it's a very sort of like compact uh and well organized series of spaces um <clears throat> so there's a prayer hall and then behind the prayer hall there's a more open glazed courtyard area and then behind that or, or alongside that there are the more uh, sort of offices and community facilities and library and so on and then it's a very flexible building. So the courtyard area can become part of the prayer hall and there's extra people to overspill. Uh, and it functions just very well as a kind of everyday, um, everyday uh, sort of prayer space and community space, I think. So I think that one I really like because of its, because of its, um, the way it's, its functionality and the way it can be used and the layout, it's all very well thought through. Um, I mean, yeah, Regent's Park Mosque, I think is a, is a sort of, uh, really, uh, it's, I think it's a really great space uh, and ex- experiential kind of building. Um, yeah, but also Hannah is here, who's uh, one of my sh- former students as well, who we've been working with. So I think she's probably got lots of ideas about. I was just about to, um, yeah, I was just about to say, I'll unmute you, Hannah, as well. Yeah, hi, assalamu alaikum. Um, it's an amazing talk. And um, yeah, it's been an honor working with Shahid. And just uh, like a few comments about mosques, I think, because I visited um, Cambridge Mosque just before lockdown, like a few weeks before lockdown. And so, like, experiencing it firsthand, um, I understand why some people weren't too happy about it in terms of it becoming more of a a tourist attraction than a place of worship because architecture is beautiful but I think this the second issue was that not a lot of people were used to having um, women praying right behind men so you know you'd see people walking in a bit like not aimlessly but they're a bit confused about what to do but I think coming from um, like my country back home we have that a lot where women there's not there's not even a partition just women pray behind the men and they they fill up from the back and the men fill up from the front so I think if it was exercised more in the UK I feel like it could also um, bring more women to to mosques and sort of build up the uh, like the community feeling that women experience in mosques and just design wise that it's quite you know being an eco mosque it was something that was quite new for um 
for us as Muslims, like quite a step forward. So um, yeah, but to speak in terms of a favorite mosque, I for me, it's, it's Regent's Park because it's childhood. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's how lots of people choose their mosque because that's the one that they grew up with. They grew up with, yeah. Um, and just for the audience as well, uh, sorry, Hannah, where are, you, where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm from Syria. From Syria, okay. Yeah. Some beautiful mosques um, in, in that region as well. Um, so that's, that's two for Regent's. I think that's an interesting point as well that Hannah raises about the female, the women's experience uh, of the mosque as well, because it's obviously very different to the male uh, experience. So I'm always quite interested in that, in that how do women uh, feel about many of the mosques that we talk about and, you know, look at when, you know, use it quite differently or parts of it you can use and parts of it you can't use. I mean, you two can give your thoughts on that and I don't know if there's anyone else. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's I'm, open. It's open to everyone. I think Regent's Park is a good example of having purpose-built women's space because a lot of the time mosques don't really, well, like the architecture of them don't really take into account a space for women, and they most mostly end up praying in like a room or like a basement that was never intended for women. But they just realise at the end, oh, like we have to have a space for women, so let's just chuck them in there. But <laughs> Regent's Park does have an actual allocated women's space, so I think that's why a lot of people gravitate towards it. Obviously, it's beautiful and everything, but. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, and could you, just for the viewers that might not be from, from London, um, how, how does it work? So uh, is there a separate entrance for women or, or how is it secluded? What are the additional benefits for this mosque? Yeah, so Regent's Park has, um, so it's got a giant courtyard and then it has a separate entrance for men, separate entrance for women. And they have, they just go up their stairs and they go onto a mezzanine, which overlooks the men's um, prayer space. So they still have, they still get to be a part of um, the experience that men have they still get to see the dome they still get to um hear the imam um they they hear it through a speaker but they're able to be in the same room that the imam is in which is i think it's, it's, it's a good thing and it makes it more special for women as well um mm. yeah this this is actually a, a topic that was raised um a couple of weeks ago in a, in a different in a different session as well um and actually uh, Shahid, you've made it you made a really good point actually it'd be really good to hear from the, from the perspective of women as well about well what's important um, for 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 women to be able to u utilize a mosque not just for prayers but also as a facility because it's a community it's a community building right um, and and the second part of that is to what extent are women architects involved in designing these spaces as well when thinking about the the, the building and mm. um, and that sort of stuff as well it, does that happen I don't know uh, I mean these guys are now so that's what that's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I haven't come across, actually, interestingly, yeah, I haven't really come across mosques designed by women architects in this country. I mean, it, it does happen in other countries. Um, you know, wasn't, Turkey, uh, I can think of an example. Cambridge Mosque. Hmm? Wasn't Cambridge Mosque designed by, like, the main yeah. person was a woman? Yeah, she was. And her yeah. husband, yeah, her and her husband sort of designed it, essentially. So her husband passed away, unfortunately. Um, so that's why she's kind of running the practice now. Um, so yeah, in a way that 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 I certainly have a woman involved in that uh, uh, building as well. And and what kind of differences were there seen if if it was designed in addition to a woman there? Well, interestingly, um, so Julia Barfield, who's the architect of, uh, who runs the practice, she said that um, she was quite, you know, she's quite uh, keen that the the female space uh, was very well integrated with the main space so there wasn't like a big distinction between the spaces uh i mean i think ultimately it was a client who drove that uh, um design concept so in cambridge the idea is that you have one big hall and there's a screen which separates mm -hmm. the male and female but the screen is higher at the sides and at the middle it's actually right down low isn't it and in fact there's one point where there's nothing in between isn't there i think um there's like a gap between this the two prayer halls so I think the idea was that the women could choose where they wanted to be, either in a place which where there's not much screening, so the screen is very low, or they could be in the parts where the screen is higher. How does it, I don't know how it actually works when you're there now, Hannah. What was it like? Like um, where they the so the screens were they were also quite split up as yeah. well, like they were panels, and they were able to move it uh, forward and back depending on um, if they had more men than women, they would move the screens back a bit, and then there was also an extra room extra rooms behind the mm. the woman's space for like kids and to, if a woman wanted to pray with their kids to like not disrupt the main hall or something um yeah. 
but uh, with the time that I went, all the screens were like kind of flat and Quite straight. Low. Like, yeah, but it was very low. Like it was around waist height. Or, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And also importantly, you, you, there's, no se- there's no separate entrances, is there? So you both, men and women, go in through the main. Mm, interesting. Room. Yeah. Uh, that's um, that's interesting because uh, I was speaking to my mum about this, and, and she so she went to the Vancouver one, and um, in the Vancouver one, so they had two separate areas, obviously men and women, but the kids typically, and this is a different topic as well, the kids typically are with the women, right? And and there isn't any reason for why they should be; it could be with the, either one. But in that mosque specifically, they had a a bigger space for women and a smaller space for men, um, because. They had a dedicated area, a, a play area for kids to be able to interact with one another whilst the women pray um, and the men pray and that sort of stuff as well. So they had all these dedicated spaces. And my mum loved it. She was like, this is sick. Like, it's so good because you don't have to, it's probably more stressful having kids running around trying to control them whilst they're praying. So mm-hmm. all of those things were thought about. Um, I wanted to raise that point. I know Farah's back as well. I know we've got about five minutes. So I'll pass it on to Farah yeah. for the last few minutes and stuff for any questions as well. But I just wanted to raise that point. Hi, Farah. Hopefully it doesn't freeze us. Hi. Thank you. I'm sorry. My computer just decided to fail and do, do a complete restart. So I apologise. Um, That's all right. um, really interesting um, talk. I've made lots of notes. I'm sorry I won't have time to ask you as many questions um, as I had um, written down. So unless this has already been um, addressed, how can um, in design? How can we make mosques more inviting so that we encourage those from um, outside of the Islamic faith to understand and learn more about the um, Islamic faith? Yeah, I mean, I think probably um, uh, having more sort of spaces like maybe within or outside mosques, which are dedicated public spaces. So the idea, you know, the idea, I mean, because of the weather here, I suppose it may be internal spaces, but then but they're almost like quite shared. They're open. They're sort of foyers almost. Where you have different activities you might have exhibitions or you know uh, jumble sales or whatever so different things that can actually happen which are community events which are shared spaces so i think part of the problem for me is that you know you get this idea of the building is completely segregated so from the outside you have to have a door for men and a door for women and that is kind of problematic to me because then families get split up you can't spend time in the mosque together as a family so your kids have to go one place and the mum has to go one place and so on so, you know, I, I sort of think that you should have, everything should be like as integrated as possible. And, and if you have to use, which more or less, you know, is, is the convention, you separate the prayer halls, but that's the point at which you can say, okay, men go this way, men go, men go that way. Um, and then you could also have spaces where, uh, you know, other people can come into and, and, you know, cafes and exhibition spaces and, you know, community rooms and things like that. Uh, much more kind of outward facing so it'd be great to be able to sort of move towards that kind of thing I think. Um, and um, just one more question hopefully I know there's about three minutes un- until I've on, so we need to thank as well um, but it's really interesting what you said about immigration and colonization I don't know if you have addressed this already but um, what impact do you think um, colon- um, decolonization and migration from former colonies has had on um, mosque design and accessibility as well. Uh, right. Oh, sorry, following on from that, how can we encourage more multi-cultural um, participation? Yeah, yeah. Because That's mosques, I find, are very cultural hubs. Um, it's very find multi-faith. It's very multicultural um, participation in mosques. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. That's not a sort of a um, ninety-second answer to that question, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> so. three minutes. We have about yeah, three minutes. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the thing that it's interesting, the multi-faith thing is a kind of interesting uh, idea because in a way I, it hasn't really taken off the idea of kind of buildings which are used by a number of different faiths. Uh, and I don't think that's a problem. I think it's quite interesting. And I think it's because communities quite like having quite distinct uh, sort of religious spaces. And I think it's about allowing that, but then encouraging you know, interaction and, and engagement, like you're saying. So buildings can be used by different people in different ways. Um, so I think, you know, with the, some of the bigger ones, bigger mosques, they're able to do more of that because they've got the facilities and the space. And But I do think it, it, there should be more of a push towards that because they're, you know, the mosques can offer a lot to the wider community, um, which is hopefully something that will start to happen. Sorry, I want to say for multicultural, I meant. Mm-hmm multi-faith so multicultural as in 
um, often you go to a mosque and there'll be only South Asians or there'll be yeah. you know, only people from Africa. Yeah. How do we get that? Yeah. How do, you kind of get How do we make mosques there? inviting for that? Yeah. I think that's really a, a, a sort of a, ta- a challenge for the management and for the people who are running the mosque, uh, because now you do find that mosques that did start as quite distinct kind of like ethnic communities, which is understandable because same language, same experience and so on, uh, gradually have started to find their congregations much more diverse because many more different types of people have come into the area. Uh, and many mosques do, do embrace that. They, they you know, different people from different backgrounds will come onto the mosque committee and they'll help run things. And you do get some really very multicultural mosques actually. Um, but I think you're right, there are still many which will retain uh, a very distinct kind of ethno-cultural identity. Um, and then people from other communities don't feel that they can take part in that. But I think that's really about how it's being managed and, and the, con- you know, the congregation and how they can actually make that change. Thank you. We, we are, yeah, I think we are just on time now. So I think that is the conclusion of that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers, actually, not just one, but all three, Shahid, Nabia, and Hannah as well. Um, thank you for joining us today. And um, we're going to go very quickly into the Azan now. So we'll do the thanks after again. Thank you. الله إني لك صمت وبك آمنت وعلى رزقك أفطرت ذهب الظمأ وبتلت العروق وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول
اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة والصلاة القائمة آت محمدا الوسيلة والفضيلة وابعثه مقاما محمودا الذي وعدته إنك لا تخلف الميعاد Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'd like to say a big thank once more to our speaker, Shahid Salim, for today's event. It was fantastic, very interesting, very engaging, and I'm sure everyone learned a lot more as well today. So big thanks once again to Shahid Salim. Um, I just want to say once again, a big thank you to Islamic Channel, Islam Channel, our media partner this year, and also to the Arts Council UK for making this event possible. And you can read more about how we're fighting world hunger with Islamic relief at iruk.co forward slash rtp. Ramadan is a month of giving and uh, charity. So we want to encourage you to support Ramadan Tent Project and help us to continue our work. And your support is vital to keep us going as the world transitions back to a degree of normality and to help us to continue our open iftars, our sunnah fasts and other events. You can find out... Um, more and donate at our website ramadantentproject.com or on our launch good launchgood.com forward slash rtp 2021 and thank you once again for joining us today um i hope you have a lovely evening and um salam alaikum <laughs>